section four of wellington by george hooper this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter three the Maratha campaigns part one tipu's defeat and death had a decisive effect on the politics of the deccan because it left the company face to face with one of the most curious contrivances which ever grew up in any country the Maratha confederacy there was really no other native power in the peninsula for oud was a subject state and the arrangement with the nizam placed him under the company's protection guarded by disciplined troops in the company's service and paid out of the revenues of the ceded districts part of the old mysoru state the nizam therefore relieved from Maratha oppression was the ally of the company and when the nawab of the carnatic was reduced to the state of one who reigned but did not govern the british power had no possible enemy in the deccan or indeed beyond it except the marathas they were not what they were in the beginning of the eighteenth century for the great edifice built up by sivaji and enlarged by his successors had become a partnership of a remarkable kind the nominal headship had passed from his race to the brahmins who supplanted his descendants the redoubtable peshwa received his investiture from the raja of satara who has been likened to the holy roman emperor but the real power in the confederacy was his who could seize it the peshwa or his minister if either were strong and if one or both were weak shinda or holkar who were not brahmins a certain deference was paid in point of form by the audacious partners toward the peshwa and he was never set aside still the actual power was sometimes taken from him and the ceaseless struggle for supremacy led to endless intrigues and frequent destructive wars over an immense extent of territory which lay between the sutlage and the bay of bengal the ganges and the tumbudra the plains of nagpur and the ports on the western sea there was rarely peace in the lands over which the Maratha chiefs held sway and before as well as after the fall of tipu sultan they were engaged in ruthless combats a great minister at puna nana Furnaviz, had endeavoured not without success to uphold the state but when he died in eighteen hundred all wisdom and moderation departed from the government for bajirao the last peshwa who substituted cunning and treachery for those high attributes proved quite unequal even with the aid of nana to contend with the partners who were equally deceitful and far more courageous so that when his minister died he soon fell from his high estate and called in the british to save him from his jealous and overbearing rivals it was this event which brought general wellesley again into the field at the head of an army some years before the death of tukaji holker was followed by a disputed succession he left two legitimate sons and Daulat Rao Shinda, supreme at Pune, finding he could not secure the Indor Musnud for one brother, treacherously attacked and murdered the other. But there were also two illegitimate sons. One of these, Vitoji, was trampled to death by an elephant in the presence and with the approval of Bajirao. The other, Jeswant, fled, was imprisoned in Berar, escaped to Hindustan and at once made war on shinda whose troops he defeated and whose cities he plundered shinda therefore hastened to hindustan fought routed but did not capture jeswant who crossing the nerbuda and the tapti entered the peshwa's territories he was a bold dashing leader of the true Maratha stamp and the flutter of his flag and the magic of his name brought thousands to his side he fought his way victoriously through Kandish and in october eighteen o two he marched directly on Pune, whither shinda had sent a detachment of infantry to aid the peshwa jeswant met them on the twenty fifth in battle near the city there were european officers in command on both sides a characteristic of a period when assuredly adventures were to the adventurous but the victory which holkar won that day was due to his own valiant exertions at the head of his horsemen whom he led in charge after charge upon the infantry and guns. His resolute character may be inferred from the fact that when his troops did not obey his command, 
that they should not enter Puna, he compelled obedience by turning his guns upon them. Bajirao, frightened by the uproar of the battle, fled during the fight to Singur, thence when he knew the result by Mahar to Severn Drogue on the coast, and finally in a British ship to Bassein, a fort on the mainland opposite the northern end of Salset. Holker, with a spear wound in his body and a sabre cut on his head, which he bore gaily, remained at Puna for a time to rule by torture and robbery. The complex situation which grew out of these sanguinary events had a decisive effect on British policy. The Maratha chiefs suddenly became, one and all, eager for British interference. Holker desired Colonel Close, the resident at Puna, to mediate between the rivals. Bajirao did more. He agreed to the conditions proposed by the Governor-General as the price of his protection, acquiesced in the establishment of a subsidiary force of infantry and guns, assigned territory to meet the cost, bound himself not to employ any Europeans hostile to England, and undertook neither to negotiate with nor make war upon other states without the knowledge and consent of the British government. It was a complete surrender and put him on a level with the Nizam, from whom he could no longer exact tribute, and the Gaikwad also, who had just been drawn within the British system. Shinda, of course, could not have approved a treaty which the Peshua secretly detested, but General Wellesley affirms that the Gwalior chief was informed of the Peshua's negotiations and urged the British government to interfere in the Maratha affairs as the only mode of settling their actual confusion. None of them intended to fulfill the bond, but each hoped in some way to overreach his rival, and all to defeat the company. Jesuant Rao alone had no hope, for being illegitimate he was the natural enemy of all. But trusting to his sword, his valour, his abilities, and being a shining leader of freelances, he fought thenceforth for his own hand, and wrote his name so deeply on the military annals of India that his pursuit of Monson is still remembered where Asai and Lanswari are forgotten. The Treaty of Bassein, December 31, 1802, was a masterpiece of policy because it consolidated British power in southern India and settled once for all the question who should ultimately hold the strongest sway in the peninsula. General Wellesley, seated at Seringapatam, had always used his influence on the side of peace and he even hoped at this period that the Maratha chiefs, if they were actuated by prudential motives, would fall in with a new arrangement. They were far from being so inclined, yet they dreaded a rupture or wished to defer one until they could combine. While General Stuart, commander-in-chief in Madras, was collecting troops on the northern frontier of Mysore to fulfill the Treaty of Bassein, Shinda brought his fine army over the Nerbuda, listened to the overtures of Holker, entered into close relations with the Raja of Berar, and posted himself at Burhanpur, not far from the Nizam's boundary. There he halted in evident hesitation, giving an apparent assent, and betraying no wish to prevent the restoration of the Peshwa under the new conditions. The governor-general believed him to be sincere, because prudence dictated in action, and while Shinda remained quite a remote from Pune, General Wellesley marched up from the south and replaced Bajirao in his capital. He was specially fitted from previous experience in the southern Maratha country to perform the task, and at the request of Lord Clive, General Stuart gave him the command of a mixed European and native force, slightly exceeding 10,000 men, technically called a detachment, but really a small army. It included his own Mysoto troops, which had long been prepared and admirably equipped for any service. Thus, in approaching the rendezvous at Hurihur, he could say in a letter to Colonel Montresor, I get on well, I can march with as much celerity as ever, and with equal if not greater ease. That was because he had obtained good cattle and took care of them, maintained discipline, encouraged the travelling grain dealers, and protected the natives in his camps as well as in the villages. Again, when he was some distance forward, he tells Colonel Close that his cattle are in good order, adding, 
i get plenty of forage and i have little doubt of bringing up my detachment in good style at least as far as the kisna the reason was that he had himself attended to every detail in giving orders and kept a close watch on the execution of his behests he crossed the tumbudra on march ninth and when he wrote the words we have quoted he had tried the marching powers of his detachment for a week the general plan of operations adopted was that colonel stevenson with the hyderabad subsidiary contingent and the nizam's troops should move up to the river sina at purinda on the frontier toward Pune, and that wellesley should march northward as rapidly as possible connect himself with stevenson who was to be under his orders and enter the mahratta capital the distance to be traversed was over five hundred wellesley says nearly six hundred miles and it was covered in forty-two days he moved his army by darwad to erur on the kisna and thence to merich a march beyond the river here he turned off to his right in a north-easterly direction heading for panderpur but he did not proceed as far east as that fort having found it more expedient to effect a junction with stevenson near the confluence of the nira and the bima then leaving the hyderabad contingent on the left bank of the latter stream he turned to the westward by baramuti and jejori and made his way with some loss of transport and cattle through the rugged roadless hills descending on Pune from the eastern side he arrived with his cattle much the worse for the wear for after crossing the kistna the route of the army lay through a region desolated by the bands of holker they have not left a stick standing at the distance of one hundred and fifty miles from Pune. they have eaten the forage and grain have pulled down the houses and used the material as firewood and the inhabitants have fled with their cattle excepting in one village i have not seen a human creature since i quitted the neighbourhood of marriage such was mahratta warfare as depicted by wellesley to his brother in the last march with the cavalry only he rode sixty miles in thirty-two hours for there came a report to his camp on april nineteenth that amrit rao who held Pune for jeswant rao holker intended to burn the city therefore wellesley went off at once and moving all night did not halt until he had entered the place on the following morning the mahratta chief did not fulfil his threat as he wished to make terms for himself so he prudently decamped going out on the northern road a few hours before wellesley's tired troopers came in sight of the peshwa's palace the infantry did not come up until the twenty first major john malcolm sent by lord wellesley joined and was heartily welcomed by his friend the general at hubli and both were skilful enough to conciliate the principal southern mahratta sirdars who hated and distrusted the peshwa as much as they trusted the word of the british they even led their troops to Pune, and it was partly through their influence and partly through confidence in wellesley that during this long march the people remained in their villages that the bazaars were well supplied and that the long line of communication was uninterrupted on march thirtieth he was thus able to write after stating the alternative before him in any one of these cases i hope to reach Pune about the twentieth of april the very day of his advent on the line of march he had thought of the future not only establishing posts but in joining the construction of basket boats and the establishment of boatmen so as to secure the passage of the rivers and maintain his communication with stuart when the monsoon broke and almost his first care on reaching Pune was to direct the manufacture of pontoons at bombay the pontoons he had so longed for when chasing dandiawag three years before the government did not then sanction his demand or approve his suggestion now he was able to secure assent to his request for the movable bridges which he so justly said would give him an immense advantage over the native armies during the season of rain so far the enterprise had been rapidly and successfully executed the next steps were to hasten the arrival of the peshwa from Bassein and establish a new line of communication by the goats through panwell with bombay wellesley marched a few miles to the westward but soon halted because his absence caused alarm in Pune not yet recovered from dread of holker's marauders there is or was twenty years ago a foolish tradition in the hills that wellesley in great straits 
flung two guns into a tank but the guns so abandoned belonged to colonel coburn's force the rear guard of which under hartley fought such a brilliant action fourteen years before near wargaum the general did not encamp near the borgoat but a huge rock at Kandala still bears the name of the duke's nose in eighteen o three it looked down on the rough military road as it wound up the hills from the Kunkan. now it towers above the famous railway which running straight up from Kalyan has not wholly superseded the highway from Pune to Panwell. In 1870 a venerable elephant was killed on the Bombay Flats and ordered that his skeleton might be placed in the museum. He was reputed to be the last survivor of Arthur Wellesley's transport train. More than a fortnight elapsed before Baji Rao passed up the goats, a delay which vexed the impetuous Malcolm and increased the anxieties of his sober comrade for holker had moved upon aurangabad and stevenson was sent towards the godaveri to keep him in check and it was still a question whether the mahratta chiefs would combine either for a dash into the nizam's territories or upon Pune. wellesley judged that they would not be able to settle their personal differences yet saw clearly that in any case they should be prevented from raiding to the southward malcolm and his expressions paint the moment said if Baji Rao were at all practicable, I should have no fears, but I apprehend much from the weakness and depravity of his character. In addition, Colonel Collins, the British agent with Shinda, did not discourage the suggested advance of that chief to Pune, thus increasing the confusion and the danger. Nor was the apparent and perhaps real peril much diminished by the advent of the Peshawar, who entered his capital on Friday, May 13th for wellesley was detained another three weeks before he was free to approach stevenson avert the calamity of an inroad and bring the pending questions to a final issue the delay was not wholly due to mahratta double dealing since he had to get european iron from bombay to repair his gun carriages and he says in a letter to general stuart june second i have made one hundred and fifty wheels since i came here but at that moment he thought himself better equipped in respect of carriages than he was when he started from Hurihur. The army marched northward on June 4th and speedily fell under the exacting exigencies of Indian campaigning. There was no forage on the ground, the cattle belonging to the native dealers died, the dealers themselves, whom he had so well treated, played him false, and he felt keenly the absence of the Mahratta horse, detained by the intrigues and duplicities of the Peshawa. But some few arrived by degrees, and after a period of relative privation, his prospects of supply improved. Still, he thought, the army would have fared better in an enemy's country, for the peasants, uncertain who was to be master, concealed their grain, and what was obtained had to be dug out of pits. Neither Pune nor Bombay promptly satisfied his wants. He talked of falling back and of the folly of operating so many hundreds of miles from an assured base in Mysore. His situation, indeed, during the months of June and July was very embarrassing. In his rear was a ruler at Pune whom he could not trust. The character of the Peshawas government he found to be deceit. Bajirao promised much and performed nothing, and was moreover in treacherous correspondence with his late enemies amrut rao it is true listened to persuasive arguments and ultimately brought his troops into the british camp while hoker mistrusting all sides especially the two mahrattas set out for malva with his store of plunder but in wellesley's front south of the top tee for shinda who had been joined by the rajah of berar had come on to the edge of the nizam's frontier were two powerful armies the aim of Shinda was to defer hostilities until the rain ceased and the rivers fell, so that he might move with freedom in any direction. Therefore he evaded a plain answer to the questions addressed to him by Lord Wellesley's agent, and prepared for war, at his own time, with Lord Wellesley's brother. Such a state of suspense became at length intolerable, and it was brought to an end so soon as the general was entrusted with powers as a political agent, sufficiently large to warrant a policy of decision in the middle of july those powers arrived in his camp and he did not let them rust a steady advocate of peace he had done all he could to preserve it 
but when the objects of shinda became apparent he went straight to the mark he summoned shinda to prove the sincerity of his friendly professions by withdrawing into hindustan and the raja of berar to manifest his good will by retiring to nagpur both said they did not intend to fight or oppose the fulfilment of the treaty of Bassein. if you are sincere in this declaration of your friendly intentions said wellesley there appears to be no occasion for assembling your army and joining it with that of the raja of berar on the nizam frontier the thrust went home when you shall have withdrawn your troops to their usual stations beyond the nirbuda continued the general i also shall draw back those under my command to their usual stations if the proof of sincerity were not given then the confederates would be attacked colonel collins was ordered to press for an explicit reply and retire if one were not given the strong and simple language of the general sharply wound up the long delay at the beginning of august he had moved his army to walki six miles south of ahmednugar a fort held for shinda it was there he received the preposterous counter propositions of the maratha chiefs they were to retire to burhanpur when the british and allied armies had reached their stations in madras siringapatam and bombay wellesley's reply was prompt and plain on august sixth characterizing the proposal as inadmissible and unreasonable he put his case in a few energetic words i offered you peace upon terms of equality and honourable to all parties you have chosen war and are responsible for all the consequences such a downright negotiator who planted himself squarely on the facts who meant what he said and spoke with frank simplicity proved fatal to the game of maratha evasion as swift in action as he was plain in speech wellesley at once directed the british troops in guzarat to attack shinda's garrisons and moved up to ahmed nugar on august eighth that very day he stormed the patah or fortified suburb which was defended by a body of arabs and a battalion of shinda's regular infantry the lofty walls had no ramparts so when the stormers climbed up they had no ground on which they could stand yet they held on drove the defenders to the houses and finally after a brisk and gallant contest expelled them from the place the next day a battery for four guns was built which opened on the tenth was so destructive that the governor notified his desire to treat he wished that the cannonade should be stayed but i told him that i should not cease firing till i should have taken the fort or he should have surrendered it finally he was allowed to depart with the garrison and his own private property and on the twelfth he marched out with fourteen hundred men and the british troops marched in the success was rapid and the loss not great thirty killed including four british officers and one hundred and eleven wounded the fort thus swiftly captured was the strongest in the country and in the general's opinion only less formidable than velour its possession secured the line of advance and the sharp stroke gave its conqueror a moral ascendancy he always retained no time was lost in dispatching the troops to the Godavari, which they crossed at toka to support colonel stevenson who it will be remembered was north of aurungabad watching the marathas wellesley himself having much business to transact and letters to write did not reach toka until the twenty second for he had to communicate with Pune on many things with the bombay government which did not work well with him but as usual was disposed to fight for its own hand with general stuart who did sustain him in the most ample and ungrudging spirit who sent him reinforcements and took care to preserve the southern line of communication through the nizam's western districts arrived at toka he pushed on to aurangabad which he entered on the twenty ninth at a critical moment he learned that shinda had deceived his antagonist and had broken into the nizam's country the task which stevenson had to perform was arduous in his front were the ranges of hills which ran up from the top tea valley they were like all such apparent barriers passable at more than one point stevenson had carefully watched the agenta goat the most likely route but he had also to keep an eye on the opening at badula farther east these passages could not both be guarded being too far apart shinda took advantage of this condition 
he ostentatiously rode off with his horsemen toward Badula, and when he found that his opponent made a corresponding movement on the other side of the range, the Mahratta turned in his track, sped swiftly to Agenta, rapidly crossed the hills, swooped down upon Jolna by the valley of the Purna, and put himself between Stevenson and Aurangabad. The danger was that he would dash over the Godavari and make for Hyderabad. It was not great, however, for although on hearing of Wellesley's advent he went farther eastward, still when the general at once marched to the Godavari at Rakasbam, the Mahratta retired northward upon the line leading back to Agenta. It was a prudent step, since he had only horsemen, and Stevenson, coming down from Badula, not only recovered Jalna, but harassed his camps by night attacks. These incidents occurred between August 22nd and September 9th. The reason for Wellesley's apprehension respecting Hyderabad was that the Godavari suddenly fell and became fordable anywhere. End of section 4section five of wellington by george hooper this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter three the mahratta campaigns part two it may be doubted however whether shinda had any plan seeing that neither his regular infantry nor his heavy guns had joined the swarming horse wellesley was glad to hear that both were coming as the infantry would be something solid to go upon, and the guns would retard the marches and give him a better chance of coming up with them. His own army was never in such marching trim, he told the sympathetic Malcolm, then absent and ill. I marched the other day twenty-three miles in seven and a half hours. All our marches are made at the rate of three miles an hour." On September 18th, a much-needed convoy with a military chest and many cattle came up from Mysoru, and that set Wellesley free to act. He moved at once northward towards the enemy, joined Stevenson near Sail Gaon and Budnapur on the 21st, and arranged a plan of offensive operations. The Maratha army at that time, complete in horse, foot, and guns, was understood to be near Bokardun on the little river Ketna. Between them and the British rose a chain of heights above the right bank of the Puna, and their camps could only be reached by traversing the passes in two bodies and uniting on the northern slopes. Stevenson took the western and Wellesley the eastern road, designing to fall on both flanks of the Maratha host. That movement led to the Battle of Asai, or Asai, as it is written in the old books and maps. Wellesley marched on September 22nd into the hills between Budnapur and Jolna, and farther on the next day as far as Nolnaya, which he reached at eleven in the morning and where he intended to encamp. But here he found himself unexpectedly within six miles of the Confederates. A dragoon patrol brought in some grain dealers who told him that the Marathas were there and might be seen from a rising ground, but that they were preparing to depart and that the cavalry had already gone. So after securing the baggage in the camp at Nolnaya, he marched on, intending to assail the infantry, but instead of these alone he found the whole army, and yet he resolved to attack because retreat in the face of the abounding Maratha horse would have been perilous, and what is more important, because there was a chance indeed, a certainty, that getting wind of Stevenson's advance, they would withdraw the infantry and guns. In fact, it was a great opportunity as well as a great risk, and Wellesley was not long in resolving to run the risk and seize the opportunity. Wellesley had a correct knowledge of Maratha character, and he never showed it more emphatically than when he determined almost as soon as he saw the enemy to fight him where he stood. At about one o'clock he was at the head of his little band, scanning the masses of infantry, the lines of batteries, the columns of cavalry, some of whom crossed the Ketna to watch him, and then he quickly decided that he would move along the front of their camps and suddenly strike their left. It was a bold resolve, for he had not more than two thousand Europeans in his available force of five thousand men and eighteen guns, 
while the enemy had an army put by some at fifty and certainly exceeding forty thousand and above one hundred cannon it was a prudent resolve because in fighting an indian army victory follows the flag of the assailant who begins with and by his onward rush retains that moral superiority which is worth myriads of men what wellesley saw from the rising ground to the south was a series of camps set up within an angle of the ground formed by the Ketna and the ravine of the jua the trained infantry begum sumrus pullmans and dupont's were on the left above the rocky channel of the Ketna, and with them was the formidable train of artillery the cavalry stood on the right extending far up the stream toward bokerdoon the fortified village of Asai on the Nula, which covered the rear, was occupied by some foot. Wellesley's design was to march his little column diagonally to this front until he reached an unguarded fort at Pipulgalm, near the junction of the two ravines, the existence of which he inferred from the fact that there were houses on both banks. Then cross it rapidly, form athwart the angle, and falling upon the left of Shinda's regulars, roll up the whole line for some time although horsemen rode out to look at him his intention was not discerned probably he was not credited with the daring plan devised when the troops reached the ford the mahratta guns opened with great effect and as the destructive fire did not arrest the steady advance across the Ketna, the real object of the movement dawned upon the european officers in the mahratta army with the greatest regularity and precision admired by their opponents the regulars changed front forming line across the open space nowhere more than a mile wide facing the confluence of the watercourses the right resting on the Ketna, the left upon Asai, and the clouds of horse in the rear wellesley drew up his handful of infantry in two lines placing the cavalry behind as a reserve and it thus happened that instead of attacking a flank perpendicular to his front he had to engage a line parallel to his own he therefore altered his plan which now was to keep back his right push forward his left and throw the hostile forces upon Asai and the nula in its rear but the battle was not so fought at the outset for the piquets or leading troops on the right were by mistake led off toward Asai uncovering the second line and falling themselves into a deadly converging fire the seventy-fourth followed the piquets into the cannonade and a great gap was thus made in the array the enemy's horse rode up to charge and so serious was the peril on the right that the nineteenth light dragoons and a native cavalry regiment were obliged to charge at once eager for the fray they galloped up cheering as they went and cheered by the wounded and riding home even into the batteries saved the remnants of the piquets and the seventy fourth on the british left the swift and steady rush of the seventy eighth and the sepoys had carried the first line of guns and crushed in upon the second thus hurling the mahratta regulars upon the jonah nula in this part of the field the work was done with the bayonet not more than two rounds being fired by the british as the second line of guns was carried shots came from the first for the gunners who had been spared rose up when the troops swept onward and opened fire so that a resolute charge to the rear headed by the general was needed to punish the treachery this incident did not stop the forward sweep of the line which was in the nature of a right wheel and brought the troops almost parallel to the joa ravine the decisive strokes were the splendid charge of the dragoons and the irresistible sweep of the seventy eighth upon the mahratta right the whole action was fought out in a comparatively small space for the triangle formed by the ravines is nowhere more than a mile wide and the stress of the combat fell upon shinda's gunners and regulars for the cavalry scarcely took any part when the infantry fled over the nula the nineteenth again charged and unhappily colonel maxwell was killed the battle began a little after three o'clock it was over at six and in that brief space out of less than five thousand there were above four hundred europeans and more than sixteen hundred natives killed and wounded 
a rare proof of the courage and resolution which in three hours crushed a great army, destroyed a much prized native infantry, and captured 102 guns and all their tumbrils. Moreover, these grand soldiers had actually marched 24 miles before they stepped across the Katna into the battlefield. Wellesley, of course, says nothing of his own conduct in the fight, but others testify that he was always in the thick of the action, a horse dying under him, and that he was not only cool, but displayed that springing valour already conspicuous when he led his horsemen upon the bands of Dundiawag. Monroe, who by the light of the rules of war criticised sharply the mode of attack, admitted that, though it might not have been the safest, it was undoubtedly the most decided and heroic, it will have the effect of striking greater terror into the hostile armies than could have been done by any victory gained with the assistance of Colonel Stevenson's division, and of raising the national military character, already high in India, still higher. No general could desire from a competent judge more emphatic approval of his great achievement. Although the operations were prolonged for nearly three months, yet the victory of Asai practically decided the war in the Deccan. While Wellesley kept his division ready to move anywhere, Stevenson, crossing the Tapti, captured Burhanpur and the strong hill fort of Asirgur. No efforts of the enemy availed to avert these results. At first, the combined Mahratta army made a feint in a southerly direction, which drew Wellesley toward Aurungabad, but he soon discovered it and returned before they could meddle with Stevenson. Then Shinde, sending the remains of his infantry over the Nerbuda, halted on the Tapti, and the Barar Raja alone pushed southward again, passing the hills on the west and moving towards Aurungabad. Wellesley at once came down the goat, and at his approach the Mahratta went eastward, trying but in vain to snatch a heavy convoy, the escort of which beat off his horse. The general, marching one hundred and twenty miles in eight days, saved all his convoys, defended the Nizam's territories, and would have smashed the Raja had the convoy not demanded his care. But all the subsequent solid operations of the war, he wrote to his brother, depended on the arrival of that convoy, and it was more important to secure it than to gain a victory over a body of horse. After resting the troops, he followed the Raja into Barar, and Stevenson moved into the same territory. Shinda had by this time, influenced perhaps by Lake's brilliant victories, made a sort of peace which he did not observe, but as the Raja held aloof, hoping to save Gawilgurt, both armies converged upon him, and after being separated for two months, joined together at Parterley on November 29th. Though the enemy had decamped, he was still visible on the march from a tower. His cavalry skirmished with the advance, and when Wellesley rode up to push up infantry supports, he discerned his antagonists posted in front of Argaum, where he designed to encamp. It was late and hot, but he determined to attack. Designing to press the enemy's left, he advanced in two lines, the right thrown forward, but when his sepoys came within range of the guns, remembering perhaps the slaughter of Asai, they fell into a panic and faced about. Luckily, the general wrote, I happened to be at no great distance from them, and I was able to rally them and to re-establish the battle. If I had not been there, I am convinced we should have lost the day. So that it was a critical moment. When formed again, they behaved steadily, and as only Shinda's horse really fought, the action was soon over. Yet so much time had been lost that, as Wellesley wrote to his brother, not more than twenty minutes' sun remained when I led on the British cavalry to the charge. Fortunately, the moon was bright, and the horse galloped on and gathered much spoil. The routed enemy left on the field thirty-eight guns and all his ammunition. The troops were under arms and I on horseback from six in the morning until twelve at night. The immediate fruit of the battle was that Ragoji Bansla, the only Mahratta who cared about his country, soon yielded. For the formidable stronghold of Gawilgurt rested upon a block of mountain and only accessible on one side, to reach which Stevenson struggled for a week through the roadless hills, 
was battered for two days and stormed on the third december fifteenth and that fine exploit which induced the berar raja to sign a treaty ended the war in the deccan on the day after the fall of the berar fortress a welcome visitor arrived in camp malcolm who had been so long absent ill at bombay the two men thoroughly liked and appreciated each other and malcolm's gaiety and high spirits were a luxury to the staff wellesley had grown graver and older looking under the stress of his immense labours as a soldier diplomatist for the whole charge lay upon him and something of this gravity says sir john kay communicated itself to his associates much work and much thought imparted a sombre tint to the social aspects of life at headquarters they were tired and still unless there was something of unusual interest to excite him the general spoke little at table hence malcolm's arrival in camp was like a sudden burst of sunshine from one of his letters we obtain a glimpse of the two men for malcolm says i have written in the same manner as i have been accustomed to speak while partaking your favourite recreation that is pacing up and down before his tent in the deccan as a few years after in a grey greatcoat he moved up and down the little square at freneda and in his old age he walked with arbuthnot on the platform at valmer when the treaty with the berar rajah was ratified wellesley set out on his return to the south striking at a strong band of marauders on his way and warmly thanking his troops who marched sixty miles in twenty hours for their persevering activity he visited Pune and then descended the goats to bombay where he remained some days and then once more ascended to the cooler deccan i was feasted out of bombay as i was feasted into it he wrote to a friend but whether so greeted or not he never ceased his public labours and his prolific pen was never idle a deep difference of opinion had arisen respecting the proper policy which should be pursued toward Shinda, and wellesley strongly urged the governor-general to restore gwalior to that chief if that was not done and war was renewed wellesley would enter into it with zeal and ardour having no doubt of success but he added however i may be pleased with the prospect of that success as far as i am concerned i should prefer the continuance of peace for the public and for you he laments that the system of moderation and conciliation on which he made the much praised treaties should be in danger of being given up the governor-general may write what he pleases at calcutta we must conciliate the natives or we shall not be able to do his business and all his treaties without conciliation and an endeavour to convince the native powers that we have views besides our own interest are so much waste paper such were his principles and he always acted on them to the best of his ability and knowledge a warrior who sought peace a statesman who had a single eye to the commonweal the period of his sojourn in india was now approaching its term in june of eighteen o four the governor-general called him to bengal whither he at once went passing through seringapatam and madras and of course diligently transacting business all the way not long after he joined his brother came the startling news of monson's disasters which he called in a letter to mr webb the greatest and most disgraceful to our military character of any that have ever occurred the memory of it yet lives in native song and in september eighteen o four the unlooked-for success of holker seemed to shake for a moment the bases not of our power but of the recently concluded peace the governor-general gave general lake the opportunity of asking for the services of wellesley but he desired that the latter should return to the deccan thither accordingly he went in november resolved to embark for england as soon as holker had been defeated and his brother would give permission holker was routed by lake in december and at the beginning of eighteen o five all signs of danger having disappeared the general made up his mind to depart the english mail arrived at madras on february sixteenth eighteen o five with letters of september fourth eighteen o four and a gazette notifying that lake had been made lord lake of delhi and la soirie and a knight of the bath that night he determined on going to england lord william bentinck had succeeded to the governorship of madras 
and Sir John Craddock, afterwards Lord Howden, to the post of Commander-in-Chief. To the latter, Wellesley wrote in January, You think about my staying in India like a man who has just come out, and I like one who has been here for seven years involved in perpetual troubles. No Indian situation would tempt him to stay, even were he certain that in England no employment would be given to him. I am not rich, he added, in comparison with other people, yet quite sufficiently so for all my wants, and he was therefore independent of office. The truth is, a sort of homesickness had come upon him. He was inexpressibly anxious to see his friends again, especially perhaps a fair friend. She had told him that the smallpox had ravaged her beauty. But, of course, he did not allow that misfortune to break his troth. He was really ill. He appears plagued with a slow fever, wrote Malcolm to Major Shaw. He frets himself, which I never knew him do before. So it was. Writing to an agent respecting a passage, he said that he was not very particular about accommodation, did not care a great deal about the price, nor much who the captain is or what the ship, so eager was he to fly from India. The admiral offered him a passage on the trident, and after bidding farewell to his friends and comrades, personally or by letter, taking leave of the troops so long under his command, and depositing a sum of money for the benefit of Salabut Khan, the son or adopted son of Dandiawag, Sir Arthur Wellesley sailed from Madras on March 1805, bearing with him proofs of public gratitude and private affection, alike from natives who knew him to be just and humane, and from Europeans who admired his great actions, his honest, frank, and high-minded character. He sailed none too soon. To his brother he wrote in July from St. Helena that his health was restored, but that, had he not quitted India, he would have had a serious fit of illness, and to Malcolm he said, I was wasting away daily, and latterly, when at Madras, I found my strength failed, which had before held out. It was therefore time he should quit the trying climate, which he had braved so many years, and it was well for England that he reached her shores, not only with the renown he had won, and the luster of the great services he had performed fresh upon him, but with body and mind alike abounding in the solid strength and tireless energy required to front and overcome the tremendous perils and obstacles which lay hid in the future. Without undue ambition he was, what he desired to be, a great, and so far as man can be, unselfish servant of his country, who held himself bound in duty to uphold and promote, by honourable means, her honour, prosperity, and power. Such he was in India, and such he remained to the end of his days. End of Section 5section six of wellington by george hooper this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter four home soldier and civilian at the moment when wellesley landed on september tenth eighteen o five although nelson had not yet won his immortal victory consul bonaparte now emperor napoleon had relinquished his plan of invasion and was preparing to march across the Rhine on the path which led to Ulm and Austerlitz. The splendor of his deeds dazzled the eyes, but did not daunt the hearts of his insular adversaries, who had resumed that stupendous conflict by land and sea, which they conducted with Roman tenacity to a Roman conclusion. The great qualities of the sepoy general were known only to a few, perhaps to none in their fullness, except his elder brother and those comrades who had seen and shared his toils. The plains of the Deccan were more remote than they are now, and it was far more difficult even than it is in our day to realize and appreciate the merit of services in India. The minister, Mr. Pitt, who saw him more than once, was at a loss which most to admire his modesty or his talents saying he had never met with any military officer with whom it was so satisfactory to converse, so that his character soon impressed itself upon the men with whom he was brought into contact, 
and on the whole, although a little later, he was for a time thrust into a civil post, there is no ground for saying that as a soldier he really suffered any neglect. Indeed, within six weeks of landing he was ordered on active service, taking part as brigadier in an abortive expedition to Hanover. For some time also he commanded a brigade at Hastings, part of the force watching the French on the opposite coast. He did his duty in this subordinate position as thoroughly as he had done it when at the head of a great army, for it was his principle to serve the king and his government whenever and wherever they might employ him. In the spring of 1806, accepting with the approval of his friends an offer from Lord Grenville, Mr. Pitt's successor as Prime Minister, he entered the House of Commons as member for Rye, and in April he married Lady Catherine Packingham, to whom he had pledged himself before he sailed for India. In Parliament he came at once to the front and made a deep impression by the masterly, lucid, and convincing speeches which he delivered in defense of his brother's policy and administration. Nor did he confine his efforts to the House. He wrote a memorandum on the Marquis Wellesley's government, which has been justly described as still the most practical and correct essay written on the great subject, and he may be said to have enlightened and converted some of the severest critics of his brother's career. Well might he say, by your firmness and decision you have not only saved, but enlarged and secured the invaluable empire entrusted to your government at a time when everything else was a wreck and the existence even of Great Britain was problematical. What a fine censure on the folly, party spirit, and ignorance which for years animated the assailants of Lord Wellesley. You will have seen, he writes to Malcolm, July 1806, that I am in Parliament in a difficult and most unpleasant game I have had to play in the present extraordinary state of parties, nor to parties was he ever subservient. He was soon to take a more active and certainly not less difficult and unpleasant part. The death of Pitt, almost on the morrow of Austerlitz, brought in all the talents, and Fox at the Foreign Office filled Napoleon with unfounded hopes of acquiescence in his terms. But Lord Grenville and his colleagues were as tenacious as Pitt, and the peace which Napoleon says he hoped for could not be obtained. In 1807 the famous ministry struck on the hard rock of King George's inveterate prejudices against the Roman Catholics. His subjects of that faith served in the army and navy, it was true, but as it were, on sufferance. On this delicate question Sir Arthur, who held and openly expressed the opinion that no subject should be precluded from serving the state on account of his religious belief, nevertheless thought that from a practical point of view no measure was required, since dissenters of all shades did serve and had served for years ashore and afloat. The cabinet wished to make the grant of commissions to any subject lawful and brought in a bill for that purpose. But the king was steadfast, considered himself ungenerously treated, and by his opposition obliged the ministry to resign. One result of the political change was that Sir Arthur was offered and accepted the post of chief secretary to the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, the Duke of Richmond. He held that ungrateful office for two years, but twice during the period he was engaged in active service in Denmark and Portugal. It is not necessary, nor would it be practicable, to dwell on his Irish secretaryship, which may be regarded as an episode, and dealt with briefly once for all. His first labor was to secure the return of members favorable to the government. He had to buy and did buy openly by gifts of places, pensions, and titles, those persons, high and low, who disposed of seats, just as he detached an Amrit Rao from the Maratha Confederacy, or induced and Umir Khan to enter the Nizam's service. It was the custom of a corrupt time, and he did not attempt to pretend that it was otherwise than disgraceful to the men who put themselves up to the highest bidder. They were for sale, he bought them, they were a minority, yet were needed. For one member, he said, in after life, who was returned to the Parliament of 1807 through what you call corruption, Ten took their seats the honest advocates of the opinions which they held, and he thought that the tenth 
might be secured, rather than allow them to go over to the opposition. When asked whether he justified the buying and selling of seats, he answered that the inquiry opened up the whole question of constitutional government. Such was his point of view. He heartily despised a venal politician, but he thought it right to use influence in the counties and open boroughs, where in that day, 1807 through 9, almost every man of mark in the state had his price. His object was to uphold authority and preserve the integrity of the kingdom, and setting aside his private feelings, he employed the means then usual to attain his chief end. He would not ignore or gloss the great facts. What they were, and the passage is startling when read in 1888, is succinctly stated in a letter to Lord Hawkesbury. I am positively convinced, he wrote from Dublin in May of 1807, that no political measure which you could adopt would alter the temper of the people of this country. They are disaffected to the British government. They don't feel the benefits of their situation. Attempts to render it better either do not reach their minds, or they are represented to them as additional injuries. And in fact, we have no strength here but our army. There is no great change now, despite the removal of grievances, but the maintenance of the Union does not now so much depend upon the army as it does on the resolution of the people of Great Britain. At any rate, time has justified the prescience of Arthur Wellesley, who eighty years ago clearly saw the facts and governed himself accordingly. For the rest, his policy as ever was moderation and conciliation, and among his practical acts was one to establish the Dublin police and the suggestion of a measure subsequently adopted which rendered the Irish and British militia available for service anywhere in the United Kingdom. He took civil duty solely on the condition that he should not be precluded from active service, and he insisted on its fulfillment, saying, No political office could compensate to me the loss of the situation which I held in the army, and nothing shall induce me to give it up. Therefore he sought and he obtained the military employment which best suited his genius. Napoleon and Alexander of Russia gave him the opportunity of playing a subordinate yet not obscure part in the great drama. The Italian genius who led the French and the nations whom he subjected to them had almost eclipsed the brightness of Austerlitz by the crushing victory over Prussia at Jena, and in the spring and summer of 1807 he captured Danzig and overcame the stubborn Russian army in the sanguinary battles of Eilau and Friedland. Driven over the Niemen, the Russians were induced to negotiate. The terms of the peace then attained were embodied in the Treaty of Tilsit, and the two emperors appeared before the world, if not as friends, for Napoleon said, alluding to his royal associates, there are no friends among us, yet as close allies. He had no open enemy on the continent, and he and his allies settled matters as they pleased in their treaty of peace. But to that instrument there were secret articles, and one of them was that the resources of Denmark, especially her fleet, should be placed in the hands of Napoleon. He hoped also to obtain that of Sweden, and called the king arch-madman when he refused. If these ends were gained, then the French emperor would dispose of a large French Dutch, Spanish, and Danish naval force, which combined with that of Russia, would give him sixty sail of the line in the North Sea and the Baltic alone. By some means the secret was revealed to the British government, and no wonder, for the Russians raged under their defeat and hated the treaty. One day, July 15th, Count Vorenzoff gave to Lord Castlereagh a letter which had come to hand from Sir Robert Wilson, who was with the Russian court and on the 19th, only four days afterwards, the British government resolved to anticipate Napoleon and demand the temporary custody of the Danish ships of war. A combined naval and military expedition was organized and sent to sea with great promptitude, for by the end of the month it was on its way to Copenhagen. How well the British government was informed, and how correctly they judged, may be shown from the Napoleon correspondence. One provision made at Tilsit 
was that the emperor of russia should offer to mediate between england and france on august second napoleon who then knew nothing of the british expedition thus wrote from saint cloud to bernadotte who had an army of dutch and spanish troops on the lower elbe if england does not accept the mediation of russia denmark must either declare war or i shall declare war on denmark in the latter case you will be destined to take possession of tout le continent danois when he learned some days later that the expedition had arrived he directed bernadotte to offer the crown prince all the help he might need to resist the unjust aggression of england the two dispatches form an instructive contrast it is evident that nothing except the audacious policy of the british government prevented napoleon from acquiring what he considered an important naval reinforcement and the law of self-preservation which applied with imperative force at that moment justified them in thwarting a formidable adversary who was master of the continent the command of the army which including the troops already in the isle of rugen consisted of twenty seven thousand men was entrusted to lord cathcart who had for assistance sir henry burrard and sir david baird while the reserve four battalions and a few german horse was under sir arthur wellesley lord cathcart's demands were refused the powerful fleet invested the islands the troops were landed in the middle of the month north and south of the town and while wellesley drove the danish forces in the field out of zealand batteries were erected and the city compelled to endure an awful and destructive bombardment thus coerced major-general paymon the governor agreed on september sixth to surrender the fortress the arsenal and the fleet the articles were drawn up the same night by sir arthur wellesley and ratified the next morning his share in the whole transaction was confined to operations in the field and the negotiation of the surrender entrusted to him by lord cathcart he won golden opinions from the country folk gentle and simple because he protected them and punished offenders keeping his fine brigade in admirable order there are some passages in his letters which imply that he did not approve of the bombardment which was so horribly effective i acknowledge he wrote to lord hawkesbury august twenty eighth that i should prefer an establishment upon amag as a more certain mode of forcing a capitulation than a bombardment in fact the danes are fighting only for their credit it would be disgraceful not to bear a bombardment but no city with a population of seventy or eighty thousand inhabitants can be expected to hold out when cut off from all supplies of provisions besides i think it behooves us to do as little mischief to the town as possible and to adopt any mode of reducing it rather than a bombardment at the same time he admitted that no man can judge of the propriety of any particular plan of operations so well as the person who conducts them and knows everything for his part he accepted the parole of the officers he captured in action and did all he could to conciliate the inhabitants among whom he moved and it is at least probable that had he led the expedition its essential object would have been attained by milder yet not less effective methods even conducted as it was it affords a fine example of what a maritime power can do in a brief space of time the resolve to anticipate napoleon was taken on july nineteenth and by october twentieth the fleet and army had returned to england bringing back fifteen line-of-battle ships several frigates and twenty thousand tons of very valuable naval stores but as mr james remarks the benefit to england was not what she had acquired but what denmark that is napoleon lost wellesley had long preceded his comrades as there was nothing more to be done a week after the capitulation he asked for leave to depart and on the first day of october was dating his letters from number eleven harley street london preparing to face in ireland the long nights fast approaching a suggestive phrase too common in the records of that unhappy country End of section six section seven of wellington by george hooper this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami 
Chapter 5. The First Rescue of Portugal. Eight months afterwards, he once more left the Irish office for the field. Without a foe in arms on the continent, Napoleon, who had long looked on Spain as a dependent ally, soon after he returned from his triumphs at Tilsit, set on foot that series of dark and intricate political and military manoeuvres which, beginning with the seizure of Portugal, led to the quasi-captivity of the Bourbons and the proclamation of Joseph Bonaparte as King of Spain. No mere caprice induced the Emperor to take a step which had such disastrous consequences. The extension of the dominions of his house was necessary to his system, and he never scrupled to do whatever in his judgment was likely to enlarge and consolidate his empire. The order to form a corps of observation at Bayonne was given on July 29, 1807, its object being then Portugal. On August 19th, Junot was named as the commander, and on October 12th, he was directed to march for Lisbon, as in order to anticipate the English, there was not a moment to lose. These dates are anterior to the Treaty of Partition signed at Fontainebleau at the end of the month, and show that the policy applied to the peninsula had long been designed. Junot, at the head of a Franco-Spanish army, easily occupied Portugal, the king flying to Brazil on his approach. In like manner, the several corps sent in his wake into Spain immediately seized the great fortresses, and Murat was master of Madrid in March. King Charles was induced to cede his throne to Napoleon, who at once sent his brother Joseph to fill it. But even before he entered the capital, the severe repression of a furious revolt in Madrid, having set the land aflame, the enraged Spaniards rose and took the field in every province. Napoleon persevered and poured in more troops, but although Bessieres beat Cuesta and Blake at Rio Seco, Dupont surrendered an army to Castaños at Bailen, and so great was the terror at Madrid that Joseph hurried away to Burgos, and the first week of August saw him and his whole army behind the Ebro. England heartily and lavishly supported the Spaniards, gave them in abundance arms, ammunition, clothing, money, and finally, sending her soldiers as well as her ships and treasure, she began her great and sustained conflict in the peninsula with the enormous power of Napoleon. The first army of succor was commanded by Sir Arthur Wellesley. A small force, collected at Cork for another purpose, and suddenly turned upon the peninsula, it numbered less than 10,000 men. The general, embarking in July, preceded his fleet of transports, and landing at Coruña, examined the state of affairs for himself. He had the option of operating either in Spain or Portugal, and he selected the latter because Napoleon had obliged Junot to detach some troops, and that officer could no longer depend upon his Spanish auxiliaries. Resolving to land forthwith at Mondego Bay, he ordered General Spencer to bring up his division from Cadiz as soon as possible, and prepared to face the conqueror of Portugal. When off the coast at the beginning of August, he learned that his army was to be reinforced by Sir John Moore's division then in Sweden, and some thousands from England. Several general officers senior to me, he wrote to the Duke of Richmond, had been ordered to sail, and Sir Hugh Dalrymple from Gibraltar to command the whole army. I hope, he added, that I shall have beat Juno before any of them shall arrive, and then they will do as they please with me. In that hope he was disappointed. It is explained that the troops under orders were too many for a major general, and that is the reason why he was exposed to an unexpected trial. The ministers would have trusted him, but the customs of the service were too strong for them. Wellesley had measured the risk and was prepared to incur it. His information was good, for he estimated Junot's available force at less than 20,000 men, and the fact was that he had not more than 17,000 with which to defend Lisbon and could not concentrate all these for a battle. The little British army, composed of splendid fighting men but weak in cavalry and guns, was therefore put ashore 
on the rocky and wind-beaten coast of Portugal during the first week of August. General Spencer, too, came up from Cadiz in time, having sailed as soon as he heard of Dupont's defeat and before Sir Arthur's orders reached him. Even with his reinforcement, the army was less than 14,000 strong, but it was a solid force and eager to encounter the French. The Portuguese in arms, of no use as soldiers, disposed to be presumptuous and requiring management, were a moral help rather than a military adjunct. From the Mondego, having the sea and friendly ships on the right, the army started on the ninth for Leira, a town on the high road from Lisbon to Oporto. That very day Napoleon, at Nantes, desiring to dispel the fears of his brother Joseph, who was then not at Burgos, whither the letter was addressed, but beyond the Ebro, told him that the English were of little account, they have never more than one-fourth of the numbers they pretend to have, Lord Wellesley has not four thousand men, besides they are directed, I believe, upon Portugal. Trusting to his own grand projects for the subjection of Spain, and evidently misinformed, he undervalued the military power of England, which no doubt was then an unknown quantity, chiefly because her enormous strength had been frittered away in fantastic expeditions. He also believed, as appears from a letter to Junot dated two months earlier, that the affairs of Spain would be ended before the winter, another proof that continuous success had taken the edge off his usually accurate judgment and had made him overconfident. The British descent upon the coast caught Junot unprepared, and the Spanish insurrection had shaken his nerve. As soon as he heard of the landing, he summoned Loison's division from Estremos on the Spanish frontier. Sent out La Borde from Lisbon to support the troops on the high road, ensure, if possible, a junction with Loison, who had to cross the Tagus at Abrantes, and prepared to follow, if needed, with the reserve. But Wellesley was too quick and resolute. He entered Leiria before La Borde, and before Loison, who was moving by forced marches, arrived at Santaraim on the Tagus. The former general had been compelled to retire upon Rolissa, a village near Obidouche, covering the road to Torres Vedras. Thus, says Napier, Sir Arthur's first movement had cut the line of communication between these generals so far that he was able to force La Borde to a battle, while Junot, who had joined Loison at Alcoentre with the reserve, was remote from the field. Having his foe at a disadvantage, Wellesley pressed on through Caldas and drew up on the 16th at Obidouche before La Borde's position. The French general halted there because he did not wish to uncover the road to Lisbon, and also because he thought that Loison might push through the hills and come into line on his right. But Wellesley, not disposed to give time, attacked on the 17th. Moving out of Obidouche in the early morning, he led himself, the bulk of his army, and twelve guns upon the heights of Rolissa, detached a small Portuguese force under Colonel Trant to threaten the French left, while General Ferguson, with two brigades and six guns, was sent up the mountain, which shut in the valley on the south, to move along the ridge and turn the French right. Thus assailed, La Borde, who has been rightly called a practiced warrior, relied on the suppleness as well as the courage of his soldiers, and frustrated the flanking movements by dexterously drawing off to the higher ground on the next terrace of the rugged and wooded hills above a village called Colombiera. The British pursued, still bringing a powerful pressure to bear on the right of the enemy, which he as tenaciously held fast, because on that side lay the line of succor as well as retreat. The combined onset, too impressive to be withstood, led to hard fighting in the gullies and woods, and some loss for the foremost British battalions in their eagerness mistook the path, and were driven back before they could form on the crest. But when the force was developed in front and flank, La Borde, wounded yet still holding his place in the combat, again drew clear out of the hostile grasp, and formed afresh on another eminence. It was his last rally, and as Ferguson came abreast of his right he glided along the crest, and gained the road to Runa, weaker by the loss of three guns and six hundred killed and wounded. The British return gives four hundred killed and wounded and seventy missing. It was a brilliant action, 
and if the invincible soldiers of napoleon found out that the britons could fight the latter learned that their opponents were brave adroit and well commanded wellesley did not pursue at first he resolved indeed to enter the hills by torch vedras but in the evening news came that the brigades of anstruther and Ackland were off the coast and he took up a position near vimairu to cover the landing the reinforcement was a valuable addition to the army the newcomers landed on the nineteenth and twentieth in light marching order their uniforms and a blanket a few rations and sixty rounds of ammunition a man in that state they went at once to the front and plunged into battle but it is recorded of these troops that the men had great joy for they were relieved of their hair tying which was an operation grievous to be borne a stroke of state had actually abolished the pigtail during the halt above Masera bay junot had united and reorganized his troops at torch vedras he was still inferior in number but he had a vast superiority in cavalry the arm in which the british were deplorably weak hoping to surprise his foe he set forward on the evening of the twentieth but found the road so difficult that his army was not able to emerge from the defile until six o'clock the next morning the british army had passed the night on a ridge which ran eastward from the sea up to a valley where stood the village of vimairu above the dip rose a lofty plateau forming a position which defended all the roads leading from torge vedras and also the road to lorigna it stood above the two converging ravines traversed by the watercourses forming the Masiera, and on its left the heights continued for a couple of miles when they swept backward to the sea. The British had been under arms since daybreak and were alert and prepared. The march of the French reported in the night was indicated in the forenoon first by dust and next by sprays of horses on the right and columns of foot bending to the left. Then they almost disappeared in the hollows and woods. The general, seeing the drift of the movement, sent Anstruther and Fane over the valley to hold the hill above Vilmairu, directed Ferguson, Nightingale, Bowes, and Ackland to form on the left, but kept Hill as a reserve on the eminence where he had bivouacked behind the right. These operations were still in progress when the battle began by a fierce advance on the position held by Fane and Anstruther. The French dashed forward with their usual impetuosity and drove back the 97th, but were brought to a stand by that regiment combined with a flank attack from the fifty-second next laborde tried to pass the left of fane but he brought his guns to bear with terrible effect and the fiftieth charging with a will the column was shattered then kellerman threw a body of grenadiers into the fray compelling the forty-third to give ground but again they fell under the fire of artillery and the forty-third rallying bore furiously down upon the head of the column and with a short but fierce struggle drove it back in confusion the twentieth light dragoons two hundred sabres dashed into the disordered crowd but margaron galloping up at the head of the french horse routed the hardy dragoons and killed their colonel practically the battle was now over on this side but it still raged on the british left for Junot had sent two brigades to turn it, not knowing the obstacles in the way, how strong the ground was, and how well filled. Solignac's brigade coming along the crest was crushed by Ferguson's infantry, its commander wounded and six guns taken, but Brenier, who had been struggling all the morning in the ravines below the ridge, suddenly broke out upon the flank of the British advance and recaptured the guns. The astonished troops quickly rallied, turned heavily on this unexpected foe and not only defeated his column and recovered the lost guns but captured brenier it was only noon so sharp as well as swift had been the fight the french divisions were cut asunder and they had no reserves at hand for all had been engaged wellesley who had closely watched the battle knew this and now desired to complete his victory by pushing junot into the valley of the tagus and by occupying the mountains to cut him off from Lisbon. But here Sir Henry Burrard took command, stopped the army, saved Solignac from capture by Ferguson and Junot from pursuit. The pause of a moment enabled the quick French troops to gather themselves up and regain Torch Vedras. 
their loss was one general two thousand men and thirteen guns the british seven hundred and twenty wellesley's share in the campaign of portugal ended about noon on the twenty first when for what he admitted to be fair military reasons burrard on taking command declined to accept his plans his original design formed as early as august eighth was to move sir john moore's division from mondego upon santa Rime, so as to cut off the retreat of the french upon elvash and turn the line of torjvedrash by the tagus but sir harry burrard objected when the third commander sir hugh dalrymple landed on the twenty second he agreed with burrard and moore was ordered to land at Masera. nevertheless sir hugh agreed to march the next day but in the afternoon general kellerman arrived with a flag of truce opened negotiations for the evacuation of portugal by the french army and was actually allowed to draw up himself the terms of suspension of hostilities pending the settlement of a definite convention wellesley signed it at the request of sir hugh he says that it was negotiated by the general himself in my presence and that of sir henry burrard and after it had been drawn up by kellerman himself sir hugh directed me to sign it but he did not approve of it and only put his name to the document out of deference to the commander-in-chief and to avoid being considered the head of a party against his authority he regretted afterwards that he had signed it even for such reasons and was so deeply impressed by the waste of fine opportunities that he described himself privately to the duke of richmond as sick of all that was going on nor was his feeling unreasonable he had commanded the army won two actions and was not permitted to reap the fruits of his skill and energy as a matter of fact the command was taken from him on the morning of the twentieth for then sir harry who was on board ship directed him to halt on the twenty first for which day i had ordered the army to march so that had junot succeeded in surprising wellesley on that morning it would not have been his fault i took command in the battle of imairu he says because sir harry was still in his ship and because if he had been on the ground he could have done nothing in fact he won the battle for the other generals and then fell back into a subordinate position when the convention finally signed at lisbon and not at sintra was known in england there was an outburst of wrath which at first fell in all its fury on sir arthur and greatly vexed him but he would not attack sir harry and although sir hugh accused him of imprudence and temerity and otherwise assailed him he said i have thought it but just and fair to sir h dalrymple to avow that i was of opinion that the french ought to be allowed to evacuate portugal as matters stood after moore had been directed to re-embark the men he landed at Montego in order to march on Santarém. If that had not been done, and if his own plans, which were sound, had been carried out, we should have been some days ago, he wrote to Ferguson on August 29th, in a situation to have refused to the French any capitulation excepting on the terms of their laying down their arms. Whether that would have been so or not can never be known, for the plan was not tried but in any case no blame for the convention can rest on the man who after winning the battles which broke the spirit of the french was cut short in a victorious career by generals of lesser ability who frustrated his plans and did negotiate the convention on the whole even if we agree with napier that the convention was a great and solid advantage for the allies a blunder on the part of the french it must be admitted that wellesley's far-reaching and vigorous designs were never tested and that considering his genius he might well have achieved the large ends he had in view captured the army of portugal and held fast the country as he did in after years as matters fell out he was exposed to public odium for offences which he did not commit and had to appear before a court of inquiry to defend what he had not done in the end he was vindicated and the whole transaction now stands on record as only one among many examples of the blunders of which governments nations and armies may be guilty when without knowledge or capacity and tied up with too much red tape they plunge into the tremendous hazards of warfare and make their interests and passions the judges of methods and results wellesley left the army on september twentieth bearing with him the affectionate regards of his officers and arrived in london early in october 
he at once visited lord castlereagh and sir hugh being recalled he learned to his delight that sir john moore whom he greatly esteemed had been appointed to lead the army into spain i find he wrote to moore that i am placed under your command than which nothing can be more satisfactory to me he hoped to join him at once but the inquiry at chelsea anent the convention detained him in london until december and thus his destiny was not corunia but dublin castle End of section seven